Hello, and welcome to the Finding Something More to Talk About talk show. I'm Nancy Wrench, your host. My guest today is not only the recipient of our 2019 Woman of the Year Award, she is also a woman of tremendous strength, resilience, and character. Please welcome Jessica Everett. Hi. Hello, Jessica. Oh. It is so good to see you. How have you been and how have you been through the pandemic? Very busy. Very busy. The pandemic hasn't really affected me too much, you know, working full time still. So I call myself a frontline worker, even though I'm not a nurse. But yeah, uh, yeah still been working, still busy. Good. Well, that's, yeah. a, that's a good thing, right? Yeah. Well, we're just going to go right into this, this subject because it really, really means a lot to me. Anytime that we can talk about how a woman has faced um, challenges and struggles and was able to pull herself back up and get to the other side, mm. I want to interview them. And you know, I've gotten to know you and I absolutely adore your work and I adore who you are and what you're doing for other women. But let's just go back um, to your childhood. I remember you telling me that you always felt that you were destined for greatness. What, what did you mean by that? You know, as a little girl, um, it's really interesting. I, I never really thought about, about it in a broader spectrum, but when I was little, I used to think I had magic. And so like changing things and being able to affect something that I normally wouldn't have control of. I mean, it, it goes as far back as just thinking, you know, seeing something on the ground and thinking I, I made it move or I did this. It was just like this, something inside of me that told me that I had this special gift. And, and I didn't know what it was until obviously, you know, as an adult and, and everything that I've been through, but as a little girl, what is it, what is it that you thought, what, what is that gift? Um, you know, I think my gift now is um, being able to help people go through um, hardships and sharing my story and my testimony and, and affecting them in a way where they know that they can overcome or get through something. That's right. So well, um, you you know that I I understand that divorce. I was not from a divorced uh, family, but I do know many many people who who really really had to struggle in a way that I can't personally understand. But you had shared with me that your divorce had a big effect on you, and I was just wondering about that experience and how it changed your life. My parents divorced. Yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, my father, my biological father was an alcoholic and an addict as well. And so um, they divorced at a very young age. But um, and I didn't really realize the magnitude of the effect it would have on me as an adult. But as a child, it was hard because you always want to be, you know, daddy's little girl. And, um, you know, I would wait for him to come to soccer games. I would wait for him to show up to my activities and not showing and just, you um, the sadness that it brings as a child and kind of that disconnect from the, oh, sorry about that, from the other parent is really hard. You know, it really affects you and, and you don't really realize it until you're an adult, until you start going through therapy and, and things of that nature. But um, it's hard to, as a kid, to wonder, you know, if it was you that did something, you know, if it was your fault. Right. But how did that experience how does that play out in today, this very day in your life? What did that experience do to you to equal who you are today? Uh, it made me a better parent. It, it makes me realize how important it is to be fully engaged in everything that they have going on um, and, you know, not missing a game. I, I, th I don't think I've missed one football game of my sons or one cheer activity of my daughters. And um, it kind of just molded me into being a parent that I was missing. Mm -hmm. So it, and just a better human being of not being displaced or not being missing from the scene, you know, just making sure that I was always um, available. I, I guess that would, that would be the best way to explain right. it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so through, okay. So you went through the divorce of your parents, which was extremely painful for you. Right. And, and then you hit your teenage years mm -hmm. and part of that experience uh, with a divorce, I'm sure kind of, kind of um, catapulted you into maybe some other 
experiences. I know you had mentioned drugs. I want you to elaborate on that. But my question when you when you talk about this is when you got into drugs, was that because at that time from the very first time, was it because you needed a connection, felt uh, you felt you needed a connection with your friends, wanted to be a part of the group, wanted to just party, or did you identify with no, I'm hurting. I'm in pain. I want to numb myself because those are two different, two different uh, routes to 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 drugs. I believe Absolutely. I yeah. have never had a propensity for drugs or alcohol or any of that. Um, so I'm talking out of my experience. I I wasn't. Um, I never was drawn to it. So therefore, I'm interested in finding out what. Um, and I had, you know, challenges and pain like everybody else. I'm not a divorce, no. And I'm wondering, did it, did you say, I, I can't take this anymore. I, I'm going to, I'm going to do drugs. And I want you to take the audience through, through, through your teens and, and, and lead us up to, to when you realized that you had to make a sharp turn, you know? Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, other than the divorce, there were other things that kind of took place as a young teenager um, in my life that um, caused a lot of depression and um, kind of looking for relationships in men because of the lack of having a relationship with my father. So um, it made me, you know, it, it, it kind of designed decisions that you normally wouldn't make looking for that type of relationship. And so things kind of, you know, trickled into other things. And so I think the first time I ever used, absolutely, it was being part of a scene, you know, it was, um, hey, try this, you know, kind of like a peer pressure type of thing. But the second you had that feeling of like, reality just goes away, you know, am, and I, hear, am I to hear you correctly? I, I just want to, I just want to really talk about this, because it's, it's very interesting to me. Yeah. Mm hmm. When I was that, this is not a comparison of good or bad or somebody's better than somebody else. This is about innately some of uh, what is a challenge for one isn't a challenge for another, right? So you had peer pressure. And I remember in high school where there was nobody that was going to force me to do that. I would, you, I just would never do it. I don't know what the difference is between that child and a child that says, yeah, bring it on. Let me try this, right? <laughs> I would be fearful of it right? Yeah. No, not that I couldn't hide it from my parents or be sneaky. It's yeah. more of scared to do the first drug. What was the first drug, by the way? Uh, the first drug was marijuana. Oh. Um, I was, I want to say 12. And that was, mm -hmm. yeah. And that was just kind of a group of kids trying it being silly. And um, I was never afraid. That was, that was, you know, the you thing. I fearless. Was, yeah. I was never scared. I think I had already been through so much that um, fear wasn't in my, it wasn't in me. I just wasn't fearful at all. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, at 13 is when I first tried methamphetamines. And you would think that you would be scared of that, you know, because it's just, yeah. it's just, it's, um, but I wasn't, I had no fear. Wow. I had no fear. And so, um, but after that first, you know, initial intake of it, it was like, whoa, it was kind of life changing in a way that you would think that most people would be like, oh my gosh, I would never touch this again. But for me, it was like, this is what I've been looking for. And that's where that numbing comes in because it honestly, just all reality goes away. Now, when you did that, now I know I've talked to a lot of parents who say, I never, ever knew. And um, of course, I don't at that age. How did you hide that? I'm sure your parents didn't know <laughs> at, at 13, right? It was very hard. I, I had to plan sleepovers at my friend's house so, so they wouldn't realize that I was up all night, you know? So it was really hard. It was very tricky, but that also trained me how to manipulate really yeah. well, right. which is, you know, not something that you want your kids doing, but I had to, because I didn't want them knowing. Um, I feared them being, um, disappointed and upset. And that's something I never wanted to do was disappoint them. But I think after that first time, I mean, most people say it takes a few times, but it was, I was addicted. I just, you know, and then it costs a lot of money, right? It does. How yeah. in the world? I mean, how, I'm just trying to think back. 
of course, I, I, my heart's dropping for your for your parents, but I, mm -hmm. but for you as the child, um, hurting so much to go down that path. But what you had to do to be deceitful, to be to to figure out how am I going to um, get the money? How am I going to get out at night? How am I right? Yes. Walking the streets is what I'm hearing. I don't know if you did that, but um, yeah, tell us. We yeah, no, I, mean, I just, I had a group of friends at that time that weren't the best group of friends um, who had parents that weren't, weren't very disciplinary. Um, so it was easy to stay the night, be up all night and, you know, lock ourselves in her room or their room or whatever the case may be and get away with whatever we wanted to because they weren't, it didn't happen at my house because my parents weren't those parents. They were right. very, so I made sure that it was always somewhere else. Right. Yeah. So, um, so it was easy to, um, go do that. And then as far as the money was concerned, I mean, $5 here, $10 there at that time really wasn't too much to ask for. So it was, you know, do I eat lunch that day or do I buy my drugs? So, so what point in your life did you realize, Whoa, wait a minute. I need to do a sharp turn here and figure yeah. out what in the heck is going on, right? There were multiple times that that happened that you would really think that would change people, um, and it didn't for me. So, you know, going to jail my first time, being arrested at 19, um, and I think a few weeks after that, once again, you know, just kind of this spiral started happening. And so you would think like at that time, that you would change um, because it's scary going to jail. It's scary being in that situation, yeah. um, but it just kind of became a lifestyle for me. So it didn't, it didn't stop me, which is the scary part. So that didn't stop me um, losing relationship to rehab. I did. I didn't go to rehab till I was 28 or actually I was 30 okay. when I got, so we're talking from 13 on and off use mm -hmm. all the way until my first arrest when I was 19 um, continuing to use, having my first child at 21, my second child at 22, still using, um, still getting arrested, still trying rehab multiple times, um, having my third child at 28. And then where it took a turn was when CPS got involved. Okay. Yeah. And that was when I was 30. Okay. Yeah. And, <laughs> So, <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. Oh boy. Oh boy is right. So, but it was, you know, it's what changed my life. So it's my rock bottom. Yeah. So most people would be like, oh my gosh, you know, but for me, it was a uh, godsend. Right. It was real it was change cannot happen until we fail. I mean, we, we can't, we don't know gratefulness. We don't know know anything until we hit rock bottom when you're in a state of mind and, and physically mentally right. spiritually right you you were you needed to go rock bottom for you to oh i needed be to go able to look up and be grateful and say oh my gosh i do wonder this though what about your family and how did it affect your family um you know so kind of going backwards a little bit you know every other arrest that i had everything I had was just handed back to me when I got back out. So it couldn't be rock bottom because I wasn't losing anything. Okay. Uh, so it was when I was 30, when the case was opened against me and I went to jail, I actually didn't realize that I had an open case until I was 11 days in custody. Um, they brought me to court and told me you have a CPS case. You know, I was like, wait a minute, what am I going to court for? I don't have court for another seven days. They're like, Oh yes, you do. So, um, that was really, um, hard, you know, being in there, being isolated, being by yourself, not having family, not having anybody to talk to, and then realizing that your kids, this entire 11 days that you've been in jail have been in a foster home. Um, so what happened was, you know, I, I got arrested and the kids were with me and the police that came to the house, you know, I had running water. I had a beautiful home. I had food in the fridge. The kids were well taken care of. And they were like, we're not going to take your kids, you know, call a friend, call a neighbor. Okay. Um, so I did find a neighbor to take them for me. Um, and then I was hauled away to jail and, um, that neighbor that took my kids called CPS and had them come get my kids from her instead of keeping them for me. So 
for a lot of time, long time, I held on to a lot of anger against that person. Like, why would you do that? I trusted you to just keep them for me. Like every other time where I would go and come home and my kids would be waiting for me this time. That wasn't the case. Um, and I had a lot of anger and it took me a while in rehab to figure out that it wasn't, you know, her fault. It was my fault. You know, it was all my, my doing. So, um, I stayed in jail for another seven days until my regular court date. Um, and I was released and I hit the ground running there. Once my kids were gone, there was no turning back. Like, absolutely not. That is not the way this is supposed to be. They mean the world to me. And, you know, I, I've always known that I was a good mom, but, um, I was lost for a very long time and everything that I thought that I was doing right or should have been doing, I could have been doing better, you know? So I hit the ground running and I, and I've been clean ever since, you know, that was October 10th, 2012. And it's coming on nine years and, um, it's and amazing. It's amazing. And, you know, and I just want to, I, I just want to say this and interject, um, the, my company finding something more. We yeah. have the Women of the Year Award, and you, like I said before, are the recipient of that award for 2019. Right. I think we had eight nominees, and you won that award. That's when I got to know you, you know, on a deeper level. Um, right. You are just exactly here today and doing what you're doing because this is your purpose. And right. I just believe that that God has. A tremendous, tremendous work for you ahead. I'm so proud of you. Thank um, you. But you know, the finding, the being, and the doing, which is what I'm all about. The finding is God. The being is um, uh, uh, personal development and growth, and the doing is your outreach. If all three of those are not balanced and if right. intact, then everything gets off balance in our life. Absolutely. That's what we all, we all struggle. We all, we're not perfect. We're going to fail. But the right. fact that you got back on the horse and you're riding and you are just a remarkable young woman. I, I just so, so very, very proud of Thank who you. you are becoming still. And Thank um, you. you really are the epitome of what I believe and what, uh, what I, why I have my company is right. for women to, to be encouraged to find that something more. And through these years and, you know, circumstances are circumstances. And yes, right. your parents got a divorce and that was horrific. And right. there was pain in that. Going into drugs was horrific and there was pain in that. You know, your, your children uh, being taken away was pain in that, blah, 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 right? Right. Where are you now? How are you able to give back now? And how are you able to to live a godly life that God calls us to do. You are there. So I want to thank you for that. Thank you for your yeah. work. I want to thank you for everything that you do. And okay. I have a, a, a question I want to ask you. Right. What inspires you to get up every morning now? Uh. <laughs> um, well, first and foremost is my family. You know, I'm now married and with the kids and everything has just been spectacular. There's just been so much growth. And, um, you know, every morning I wake up to my alarm clock, but I'm really waking up to them. So, you know, it's just, I, I just keep fighting and just keep working hard and just keep going. And, you know, those are the reasons, you know, it's your family. That's yeah. beautiful. First and foremost. Now I know you're in a book. Um, we're just about uh, done with our talk today, but I know you are in a book. Would you tell us a little bit about that and where people can buy and purchase this particular book? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my mother-in-law, she actually um, is the author of the book and it's okay. a um, correlation of a bunch of women who have been through many different types of situations and that have overcame. The book is actually called Women with Purpose and They Overcame. So like I was saying, it's just a bunch of different women sharing their stories that have been through different situations in their life. Um, and they overcame those situations and, you know, they, they're very strong women and she's a very strong woman herself. Uh, she's a pastor. And so, um, I'm really honored to be a part of it. Um, I really didn't think it was going to affect 
people as much as it did, but my story alone, the publisher thought was the strongest story in the book. So I actually won an award for that as well. But uh, the book can be found soon on Amazon. It's, it's going to be a really good read, really oh, powerful. Well, I can't wait. I yeah. just want to thank you again. And I want to thank our audience for joining us today. Just remember, there's always something more to talk about.